so I'm going to do a series of short videos about artificial intelligence. I'll link to the other films in the information section. And this first video is just a brief introduction to the history of AI. My first encounter with artificial intelligence was in 1977, when someone brought a Casio FX2000 scientific calculator to my school. I was just 11. I didn't understand what all these fancy buttons meant. I didn't know what trigonometry was. But I did know that finding the square root of any number was a really tricky business. And here, you just pressed a button and there it was. More recently, I met Desdemona, a humanoid robot, at the end of a conference here in Rome, where I live and work. Desdemona speaks dozens of languages. She answers questions in real time. She shakes your hand when you go out to greet her. The most remarkable thing was the sophistication of her facial expressions. She had a flexible silicon skin that looked 95% human. It was like one of these hyper-realist Ron Muick sculptures, if you've seen them. Her lips were almost perfectly in sync with her words and she could express concern or surprise simply by adjusting her features. It wouldn't fool anyone outright, but it made my willing suspension of disbelief much easier. Now, some of you might be wondering whether an early electronic calculator is really a form of AI. So let's do some definitions. The Oxford English Dictionary says that artificial intelligence is, quote, the capacity of computers or other machines to exhibit or simulate intelligent behaviour and also the field of study concerned with all this. So there's the first definition, to exhibit or simulate intelligent behaviour. Obviously it's a broad field and really we should speak about AI in the plural, artificial intelligences. These questions are not that new. Charles Babbage envisioned a, a mechanical thinking machine in the early 19th century. The first general purpose computers came in the mid 20th century, along with some foundational thinking about the possibility and implications of artificial intelligence. And extraordinary work, as we know, has been done in the last 10 or 20 years because of the deep learning techniques that have been applied to neural networks. We've all heard this language, even if we don't understand it very well. And the deep learning and the neural networks, all of this has been combined with the increasing power of computers and the availability of data, vast quantities. And all of this has given rise very recently to the explosion of natural language processing and what's called generative AI that's made the headlines in the last three or four years, above all through chat GPT. So the impact today of AI is inescapable, even if you are not aware of its presence. You speak maybe to your virtual assistant Apple's Siri or Amazon's Alexa. You watch automated subtitles on YouTube videos. You search for photos on Flickr or Facebook that have been tagged by facial recognition technology. You let your sat-nav find the quickest route to work. If you're lucky enough to live in Florida or Shenzhen, you take a nap while you drive, well, while you sit in your self-driving car and the car, not you, takes you home. If, like me, you're a Brit living abroad, you can turn to Google Translate whenever you need to pretend to speak the local language. Your doctor, your lawyer, your architect, your parole officer is probably using AI to help them make decisions. If you're a priest, you may have gone to chat GPT for some homily tips or even for a freshly baked and fully deliverable sermon. I don't know. Some of these tools 
like the humble calculator, are so familiar that we don't think of them anymore as being forms of artificial intelligence. John McCarthy said a few years ago, quote, as soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore. As soon as it works, no one calls it AI anymore, but it is. And AI is bringing not just speed, automation and efficiency, it's also bringing innovation and creativity. It's discovering new ways of doing things and new forms of knowledge. So think of it as being not just a tractor replacing a horse, it means you do things a bit quicker and with less dung to clean up afterwards. No, it's more like giving a blind person their sight. They can see and do things that were completely impossible before. They are living in what seems like a new world. Most of this incredible progress, though, it still comes under the heading of narrow or weak AI, meaning it can do one narrow, clearly defined task supremely well. But we are nowhere near the wider goal of general or strong or human-like AI. This is the holy grail of AI research, how to create AGI, Artificial General Intelligence, AGI. AGI, General Intelligence, would be a system that did as well or better than human beings in most areas of intelligence not just in a narrow task. It would take just a few examples and then generalise from them without the need for big data all the time. It would apply its learning to completely new situations. It would understand, in other words, the context and not just the individual task at hand. And it would have a sensitivity to emotions, social cues and human values, as well as to, say, the traffic congestion or the weather forecast. AGI would have, to sum up, a much needed dose of common sense, which is a mysterious and extraordinarily difficult quality to program into your supercomputer. And then, many believe, it will be just a short step from AGI to ASI, from artificial general intelligence to artificial super intelligence, when AI becomes self-improving and self-replicating. It can build itself again and build itself even better and build better copies of itself. If progress at this stage then becomes exponential, it's quite possible that AI will quickly become unknowable and uncontrollable. This is what's called the famous singularity, but we'll come back to that in a later video. So there we go, a brief history of AI, some of the touchstones and the interesting points, some of the questions, and I'll go on a bit deeper in some of the later videos.